there is a creature that sits dormant in each of our bellies. A being whose very existence represents a deeper desire for consumption than the simple pangs our body sends when we haven't eaten in a long time. No, this is something else. This ugly little monster is different, darker. Something that only appears, or maybe that we only notice once we're old enough, big enough to see over the wall of our own enclosure of childishness, past the barriers of innocence we've been clinging to, and once we do see it, that hidden demon in our bellies, there's no going back. Do you remember when you were little, the first time you looked at an adult, maybe a parent or a teacher, and noticed that there was something wrong with them? And I don't mean in a dramatic horror movie reveal kind of way. I mean, when was the first time you talked to a drunk person? The first time you saw an adult cry or hit another person? As children, we're taught to believe that being an adult means having things figured out, not reverting to the emotional outbursts and responses that define childhood behavior. So when we see it, even as a kid ourselves, it feels incorrect, out of order, almost dreamlike. There's a power dynamic that exists between children and adults, an unspoken agreement that makes things work, kind of, usually. The agreement is, as the adult, you have more power, but also a greater responsibility to control it, and as a kid, you have less power, but a lower expectation for self-control, which means that the burden of maturity and benevolence is always on the adult, the one who holds the power. Some adults fail to recognize this burden, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. This dynamic, while typically considered to be the bare minimum of caregiving, is essential to providing a child with a stable enough environment that they can grow up well-adjusted and with a healthy understanding of complicated things like love, power, respect, and discipline. In any situation that involves children and adults, the children are always the dependent variable. Very infrequently does any change in child behavior significantly impact that of their caretakers, but a change in caretaker behavior absolutely affects the child. That's why when this essential dynamic is interrupted or changed, the results are always much more visible through the child and not the adult. Adults are scary, because most people are one, statistically, and as a kid, you recognize that not only do these people have authority over you, but most of them also have real strength, size, and agility on you. When these are good people, people you trust, people who would use their power to defend you, this is a good thing. Let them do the heavy lifting, let them do the hard thing. When these are not good people, Adults are really scary, because even the good ones still have that thing in their stomachs, that squirming bastard just itching to be let out. I think a lot of kids can see the monster from their angle. I think a lot of kids know how little it takes for that monster to get out. Adults are really fucking scary, because some of them are not good. Some of them are very, very bad. The adults in Little Nightmares are very, very, very bad. Little Nightmares is a fictional series, but you know what's a real nightmare? Trying to deal with internet security. In a digital age, there are more monsters than ever to avoid, with an endless supply of accounts, passwords, emails, and phone numbers for creeps to peek at while you're not aware. That sounds pretty frightening to me, and that's why this video is sponsored by Aura. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. I looked up my phone number on one of the hundreds of information selling sites that anyone can access and realized that details about my life, including social media accounts, family information, and even stuff like my address was available for purchase at a very low price. We all have gotten used to the idea that privacy is hard to come by, but seeing it all laid out like this was very spooky. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. 
Pretty recently, AT&T revealed that over 73 million customer records for both existing and former customers were released on the dark web. They recommended that those affected use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. Well, Aura does all of this for me. And best of all, I don't have to download several different apps just because a company couldn't keep my data secure. If my info was compromised in the AT&T data breach, I wouldn't worry because Aura is always on, always doing the hard work of keeping me safe. I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to Aura.com slash Connor McGrath to start your two-week free trial, also linked below in the description. For all you know, your life could become a living nightmare in an instant. I can't help you with that, but thanks to Aura, you don't have to worry about the same thing happening online. I'm genuinely a really big fan of Aura, not just because their product is great, which it is, but because they've shown a clear devotion to helping support other horror creators like myself and a number of channels you probably also watch. So again, please go hit that link and thank you so much Aura for sponsoring this video. Now we can get back to our video with the idea of internet insecurity drifting away like a bad dream. Howdy boneheads. It's been a while since we've gotten a full video, huh? I want to very quickly thank everybody for the kind words and wishes they sent about my accident and recovery, and, and let you know that your support helped me get through a difficult time. I'm so excited to be returning back to my regular content and have a few really great videos well underway, so get hyped for that. Now, without any further ado, in August of last year, Supermassive Games and Bandai Namco announced the release of Little Nightmares 3, and while that release has been pushed back to 2025, I thought it might be a good idea to look back at the games and the other pieces of fiction that have been released before this third installment into the game series is available. For people who've played the games, this video will act as sort of a recap with some theories, supplementary information, and larger ideas sprinkled in. And for those who haven't played but want to know what they're in for, this video is a great place to start. There will be spoilers in this video, and there won't be another warning about it, so if you're interested at all in playing after hearing my introduction or seeing the b-roll, I'd really recommend doing that first, then coming back. The games are pretty reasonably priced and can be completed comfortably over the course of a few hours. This video will still be here when you're done. The universe of Little Nightmares is one of the most interesting horror settings I've ever encountered, and it might surprise you to learn just how many pieces of official Little Nightmares content exists out there. There are two main games, each with their own DLC, a series of digital comics, a mobile game, and even a six-episode podcast series. I'll be talking about all of these, but obviously, most of my focus will be on the two main games. However, before I do that, I want to prep you with some recurring things you'll probably notice from this universe. Almost every story, from the games to the podcast to the comics, touches on one or more of the following ideas. The idea of hedonism, or manic, almost mindless consumption. Food shoveled into mounts without being tasted, morbid obesity while others nearby starve, actively choosing the less healthy or more disturbing option when it comes to sustaining yourself. The universe of Little Nightmares has a lot to do with greed and selfishness, and in many cases, this focus is presented in the most grotesque and exaggerated light possible. The idea of constantly being watched. There is eye imagery everywhere in Little Nightmares. Covered mirrors, buildings that sometimes lean forward to get a better angle on you, and near the end of Little Nightmares 2, we get a peek behind the cosmic curtain of this universe and realize that even the strangest and most deeply entrenched parts of this conspiracy seem content, at least for now, just to keep watching you. It's very Magnus Archives coded. The idea of social hierarchy. In Little Nightmares 2, during a section where you're exploring a school, you encounter a bunch of monstrous children. Those children are annoying threats until the teacher is nearby, at which point they all become well-behaved and the teacher becomes the new threat. And though it's never overtly stated, a lot of the story events would imply that the teacher likely acts and reacts at the behest of the signal tower. What I mean to lay out is that every antagonist in these games are independently threatening, but none of them are alone, and none of them really seem that smart or capable. Most of the actions and violence being enacted by our antagonist seems to be part of a larger whole, a means to an end, or a product of some larger motivation held by a third party. Our antagonists are working for others, with some exception. The idea of hidden identity. In these games, you're going to notice a lot of people wearing masks, including your own character in the second game. The iconic yellow hooded raincoat from the first game also does a great job of hiding your character's full face, same with the lighting and the framing. For what reason does identity, or rather the hiding of it, take such great precedence in these stories? Well, we'll talk about it a bit more later, but part of that answer is probably the next recurring idea. The idea of betrayal and vengeance. In pretty much every story being told in this universe, there's at least one betrayal and one moment of violent retribution. You have to deal with a lot playing through both of the Little Nightmares games, and during that playthrough, some really unfortunate things are done to you. You're attacked, imprisoned, chased, 
at any given time, there's usually at least one entity actively trying to murder you. That gets exhausting. Eventually, you have to do something about it. It's only fair. A lot of the enemies in these games get their just desserts when their time as the antagonist comes to a close. These scenes are usually the most satisfying you'll encounter while playing. What's less satisfying is the strange, almost out-of-character cruelties you enact against others sometimes in these games. It happens infrequently, but when it does, it raises a concern you hadn't even thought to consider. What if you're not any better than the things trying to hurt you? What if you're worse? All these themes are pretty crucial and easy to recognize while enjoying the universe of Little Nightmares, but there's no theme more relevant and worthy of mention than the final one. The idea of adults being bad. Little Nightmares does a really good job of creating horrifying and completely unique creatures that clearly also represent real-world identities or situations. Speaking broadly, your main antagonists of the first game are a janitor, two chefs, and a woman. Now, if you know what those characters look like and what they're capable of, you know that those titles are incredibly reductive, but the point still stands. There are familiar elements to our enemies. Which is really the point that I'm making when I say that adults are bad. It's not just that the creatures themselves are physically bigger than you and therefore are adults. Time and attention has been put into making the processes that these figures represent, processes that we'd be incredibly used to encountering in real life, especially as a child, a defined an essential part of these villains' characterization. They aren't just big monsters. They are people with careers and identities that are monstrous. There are deeper levels to this claim as well. In the podcast series, The Sound of Nightmares, arguably the most grounded addition into the series, a great deal of our time is spent listening to interactions between the counselor and his patient, which we'll get into later. The counselor is presented, at least initially, as a benevolent force who's simply trying to help, but you know that whole recurring betrayal bit? It shows up here. Interestingly, most entities are officially named kind of exactly what they represent. The character who resembles a janitor is called the janitor. The characters who look like twins and act as chefs are called the twin chefs. And interestingly, the character whose job is being a counselor is simply called the counselor, a naming convention implying that the counselor himself is also a monster. But he's not. Not literally, at least. He's just an adult. So, all right. Now that we've covered things to be looking out for, I want to introduce you to six. It's the number that comes before seven. Six is the name given to the protagonist you play as in the first Little Nightmares game, and I'm pretty confident that she's one of the most important characters in the Little Nightmares universe. These and unexplained events of the games are tied to, or the direct action, of Six. We don't know a lot about Six. Has a raincoat is perhaps one of the character's defining traits, so that should tell you something about what kind of character she is. She's a silent protagonist. We don't need to hear what Six thinks about what's happening to her because we're controlling her and should be thinking similar enough things ourselves, as long as we're properly invested. But there's a deeper mystery to Six, one that you become aware of from the first instant you meet her in the first game, and one that becomes impossible to ignore by the end of the second game. Six has something about her that makes her different, not just from the terrifying adult monsters, but from the other children around her. The game's official description of Six as a character includes the line, most children would have already given up, but Six is different. She's smart and tough and has a lovely yellow raincoat. She belongs elsewhere. And Little Nightmares 2 has this to say about the character. Awaking in a world she cannot recognize, Six must learn to trust someone else if she's to stand a chance of survival. She's already seen more than any normal child ever should, but then Six is not a normal child. So yeah. From the get-go, even in the game's own flavor text, the idea that Six is a distinctly unique entity, even among other kids, is heavily implied. So before we can talk about Six and her place in all of these stories, we first have to establish a clear timeline. All of the content that exists for Little Nightmares, except maybe the comics, are all canon to the official story of the world, a place called the Nowhere. We know that the place is called this for two reasons. The first is that the name was revealed for the Little Nightmares 3 release trailer. The description reading, Are you ready to return to the nowhere, little ones? This time, face your childhood fears together. The second is the podcast. We're going to talk about that at the end, because it adds a lot to the conversation, but would be kind of confusing to reference without a more firm understanding of the rest of the series. So, let me take you through what I believe to be the official sequence of events. How you should consume the series if you want to do it completely in order. The very first title in the timeline is a mobile game called Very Little Nightmares, and afterwards comes the digital comics, then Little Nightmares 2, until we officially end with the very first actual release from the series, just Little Nightmares. 
It's been interesting consuming the series as it comes out because it almost feels like you're working backwards, but I'm not gonna do that to you. Over the next couple minutes, I'm gonna take you through a very basic summary of the overarching plot of Little Nightmares, and then we'll come back and talk about some of the interesting things we glossed over, and when that's finally taken care of, we can discuss the podcast and its implications. So here goes. Very Little Nightmares is not a story about Six, though you'd be forgiven for believing that. Though she does appear later into the game's plot, the raincoated figure you're piloting is not Six. Her name is the girl in the yellow raincoat. See what I mean about Little Nightmares naming conventions? And she's trapped in a strange place called the Nest. You might be asking, Connor, how did she get into the Nest? And the answer is, balloon? Uh, beyond that though, it's unclear, though I think the podcast might answer that question. We'll get to it. Over the course of your playthrough, you navigate through the rooms and landscape of the nest, encountering strange monsters like the Craftsman, a wheelchair-bound and long-limbed man who tries to kill you, the Butler, a telekinetic cleaner who tries to kill you, and the Pretender, a doll-obsessed girl who tries, and succeeds, to kill you. During your time trying to escape, you encounter a young girl in white several times, one who manages to keep a safe distance but does help you out when you need it. Near the end of the game, while you're running from your life, pursued by this ravenous pretender enemy, the girl in white hits your pursuer with a boulder just before you run out of room on a high cliff to run away. There's a moment before the pretender wakes up again and the two of you plummet to your deaths off the cliff into the murky water below. All that remains is your raincoat, the very same raincoat that'll be picked up by the girl in white when she encounters it on a rainy street corner in Little Nightmares 2, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. If you haven't realized by now, the girl in white was Six, and though the story isn't about her specifically, the real point of Very Little Nightmares is showing you where Six was before Little Nightmares 2 started, and how she got to the Pale City. The digital comics help add to this. All of the digital comics can be accessed through the free application LN Comics, and the app includes six comics which help expand and add to the universe we've been exploring. The comics are very short, and some give more information than others, so I'm just going to give a couple short sentence long summaries of each of them, except for number one and number six, which we'll actually talk a bit more about last. Comic two. We follow a very young looking child in a blindfold and diaper as he attempts to survive in some kind of wilderness setting. He encounters an outhouse with a TV in it that a figure appears in, and with no warning, the child is gone, seemingly as a direct result of whoever was in the TV. Comic three. A girl is trapped in what appears to be an abandoned hospital or something of the like. She's digging at the ground with her nails, trying to escape. Eventually, someone slides a spoon under the door towards her, and she's able to tunnel out of the room she's trapped in. She wanders the dimly lit halls of the building, unaware that a monstrous figure is following her from the ceiling. Comic 4. A tricycle and a small, childlike figure are thrown off the roof of a building. A young boy in tears is pursued by a number of hideous porcelain children, children who are shown to be incredibly violent and cruel towards each other. As he runs, he uses a lollipop as a makeshift club, smashing apart the heads of the deranged children until he runs out of places and is forced to hide in a locker. A horrifying, long-necked woman finds him in his hiding place and opens the door, sealing his fate. Comic 5. We see the following events from the perspective of a child in a ghost costume. Two figures watching TV, a pile of dirty dishes, a dead rat in a cage, and an open window to freedom. Our ghostly protagonist climbs throughout the house, paying special attention to the two figures, and makes his way to the window. By the time he gets there, he's lost track of the figures, and they surprise him before he can escape, their faces twisted into hideous, unreadable shapes. So, those are the four comics that add some more information to this universe, but they don't really tell us more about the overall plot. Most of the horrific villains we see in these comics are simply the enemies from Little Nightmares 2, given a little bit more time to shine and be generally horrifying. But there's nothing critical, at least not on the surface. But before I get to that, let me first describe what happens in the sixth comic. A child wearing a paper bag on his head is one of a number of panicking children, all of which are terrified due to the fact that they've been trapped in a burning building together. It's chaos until the sprinkler system suddenly turns on and a new problem rears its head. Something is taking the kids now. A long-limbed being begins snatching up children left and right, and our child in the paper bag makes a break for it, reaching another room with a smashed TV and hiding within that television as the entity reaches the room. It's really interesting that the last thing we see of this character is him inside of a television, and you'll understand why in just a little bit here. The comic leaves what happens next up to your imagination, but there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that this bag-headed figure makes it out, leading us to one of the most important comics. Number one. What we see in this comic is a girl in white running through the wilderness, clearly afraid and pursued by something or someone. 
This is the girl from Very Little Nightmares. This is Six. After escaping the nest, she found her way here somehow and is trying desperately to stay alive. As she runs through this dark forest, she sees a figure sitting in a tree lit in moonlight. It's the kid with the bag on his head. He did make it. The two characters, Six and this kid, look at each other for a moment before suddenly that entity, the one with the shotgun that had been pursuing Six, appears and takes Six God knows where. You may have noticed the interesting factor of there being a character named Six who appears in one of Six comics that cover a total of six individual kids. A theory has been posited that Six's name is a reference to this very structure. She's the sixth of a set of children to be kidnapped or brought to whatever this place is. There's another theory about her name that has a lot to do with some environmental evidence from Little Nightmares 1, but more information has come out since that theory gained popularity, so it seems unlikely. We'll talk about it when we get to Little Nightmares 1, but first, we have to get through Little Nightmares 2, which is pretty easy after reading comic number 1. The content of the comic actually lays out the events that transpired literally just before Little Nightmares 2 begins. So, in Little Nightmares 2, you play as this bag-headed character, a figure known as Mono, a name that as a prefix means the only one, the singular, or potentially the independent. In the face of Little Nightmare 2's narrative, this is a super interesting naming choice. Interestingly, the first time we meet him, just as he's waking up from a nightmare, a staple of the Little Nightmare's introductory scenes, there's a television turned on behind him, one that shuts off just a few moments after he gets his bearing. The nightmare he had been having was something about a long hallway with a door at the end. Keep that in mind, it'll appear more in the future. You wake up in the wilderness, a wooded area that is probably the very same from that first digital comic. If we're going by that information, then it's likely that Mono already knows where the figure with the shotgun, who the game calls the Hunter, is, and where he's taken Six. You're able to find the two of them easily, with Six in a cage listening to the sounds of a music box, a song that will likely be familiar to anyone who's played through the series in order of release. This is a song of comfort to Six, one of the only things that really appears to bring the character peace throughout any of her appearances in universe. The two characters break out of the house together and begin being pursued by the hunter who fires his shotgun wildly at them, managing to barely miss or hit other objects as he mindlessly follows you. This is one of the first truly intense moments we've seen from the series. The app has its moments, but it's a bit too cartoony to be taken fully seriously, and while reading the comics we understand the stakes, we're not fully immersed in the universe, not in the same way as we are for a scene like this, where each blast of his shotgun rings through our ears in the forest, where you can hear the hunter's grunts and almost feel the warmth of his lantern light passing over you as you hide in the tall grass. This is the atmosphere that Little Nightmares is best at cultivating. And now seems to be an appropriate time to talk about why they're so good at it. The creative team behind the Little Nightmares series is clearly very intelligent, creative, and inspired, but one quality I feel they understand better than anything else is how to use scale to effectively set the scene and the stakes. Hell, even the name of the game lends credit to this focus. Clearly, one of the guiding principles to the first game's conception was the idea that every item, room, and entity should serve the grand purpose of dwarfing you as a character and making you feel even smaller than you actually are. That's why the difference in size between adults and children are so exaggerated. In reality, adults are often bigger than children, but usually to a degree of only two times or so. This makes sense because in reality, adults started out as children. However, in Little Nightmares, I have a much harder time believing this. Adults are almost like another species, many times larger than any child they encounter, capable of doing things that none of the children ever seem capable of. All evidence except for one crucial reveal near the end of the game points to the large adult entities being fully independent from the more regular appearing human entities. That reveal, though, throws everything into question and even backs up the possible fan theory from the first game. We'll talk about that later, though. What I like about the Hunter is that he's faceless. Not really, I just, I mean he wears a mask. As far as monster design goes, the Hunter isn't all that frightening. Not without his gun, at least. The thing about a person with a gun is that it doesn't matter what they look like. They're scary by the virtue of their capacity for violence. In a series that pays great attention to what scares children, what literally gives them nightmares, the idea of a faceless killer with a gun is terrifying because children are forced to think about unknown shooters regularly, whether at home in dangerous areas or at schools in general. Now, let me be clear. I think to imply that this character is meant to represent something as horrible as a shooter is incorrect. For one thing, the environment doesn't quite match up, especially acknowledging the fact that you actually do visit a school later in the game. But further, this game isn't going out of its way to tell that kind of a story. Simply, the encounters you have with the hunter give a more primal look at one aspect of what children fear, senseless violence. 
There are many instances of it throughout the series, but never is it so evocatively portrayed. Never does it feel so real. There's a moment as you're navigating this wilderness area that you encounter a collapsed bridge, one that Mono has to hold in place while Six jumps to the other edge. After Six makes it across, the only way for Mono to join her is to take a running leap off the edge and to be caught by Six on the other side. He does this, and Six manages to pull him up. It's one of the first full moments of teamwork you have together, and it's a moment absolutely worth remembering, even, and especially, up to the end of your playthrough. Eventually, the hunter corners Six and Mono in a shed where they manage to find another shotgun. As the hunter tries desperately to get into the shack, the duo of children line the gun up to face the door, and in an explosion of gunpowder and wood, fire the gun into the hunter. We don't see what happens to him, but he stops pursuing us after this point, so I have a pretty good idea. This is not the first time Six has used violence or witnessed death that she took part in, but it is one of the most hands-on times she's ever been involved. It's worth paying attention to the instances where Six is violent, because in both games, you can notice a bit of a shift in her behavior depending on the circumstances she's encountered up until that point. Six is a character that the more you pay attention to, the less certain of her stability you are. But of course, again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. At this point in the experience, a first-time player might not even be certain that the character they're interacting with is Six. She is missing her iconic raincoat, after all. The two children board a piece of drifting wood as a raft and sail out to sea, in a scene that really feels like the beginning of the game. I wonder, during this introductory scene, if maybe there's also more to the ocean itself in the series, the way it always seems to bring those who cross it exactly where they need to be, or at least where something needs them to be. There's not a lot of concrete evidence in one direction or another, but perhaps that's a testament to the cosmic nature of the sea in general. See my Call of the Sea essay for more of that. The place the children arrive is a place known only as the Pale City. And oh boy, this city is... Rough. Playing the games in order of release, this reveal of a whole city to be explored is wild, as it's such a massive scaling up of the first game's environment. Little Nightmares 2 is simply a bigger game than its predecessor, likely because of that predecessor's success. And this first look, walking onto that foggy shore, seeing the towering buildings, it's like growing up in a haunted house, then moving out into the real world and realizing that there are actually just ghosts everywhere, and that the horror wasn't contained just to that smaller example you started out in. What a great moment. You'll become aware very quickly of a tower in the distance of this city that seems to hold some greater influence over the world, or at least this city, though it seems perpetually out of reach, at least now. One thing you may start to notice more frequently are TVs, and specifically the people watching them. The tower in the distance certainly resembles some kind of point of transmission, it has to be tied to the TV somehow. Speaking of the TVs, eventually you'll encounter one that seems different than the others, almost like it's calling to you. When Mono puts his hand against the TV, he is able to manipulate the image within in a strange way. And he does so a few times until the TV sucks him into a scene that resembles the dream he had at the beginning of the game. He's running in slow motion down a long, twisting hallway towards a door, and yet, every time he seems just about to reach it, he's pulled out of the TV. This sequence of events will occur a number more times throughout your playthrough, each time Mono getting closer and closer to the door before being ripped out of the scene. We as the player don't know why Mono is so desperate to get to that door, or what's behind it, but I'd also be willing to bet that Mono himself doesn't know. It's just one of those things that happen in dreams. You find yourself running towards something like it's the most important thing in the world, even if, in the moment, you can't exactly explain why that's the case. When Mono is pulled out of the TV for the first time, Six seems anxious about the development. One of the biggest draws of Little Nightmares 2, especially in comparison to the original, is that it focuses really heavily on the teamwork and small moments of kindness or relationship between Six and Mono. In the early game, especially after rescuing her from the Hunter, Six seems very trusting of you. She'll hold your hand, help you with hard-to-reach jumps, and just generally be a friendly figure. But after this first TV moment, something has changed between the two of you. She's not against you by any means, but she seems more cautious. Because of the mobile game and the comic, we know a bit about what it must have taken for Six to get to the place she is, and we know that she didn't get here by being sloppy. She's always been cautious, and preferred to keep a distance from everyone else, even when helping them. There's no reason for Six to distrust Mono, though, not after he helped her, and clearly, teamwork is not something Six is necessarily opposed to, so their relationship, though essentially wordless except for a lot of the word, hey, was comfortable. Now, though, Mono represents an uncertainty again. And Six knows what uncertainty can mean if you aren't careful. 
There's no time to linger on that though, because it's time to talk about it. In the playground outside the school, you can find a destroyed tricycle on the ground. Interestingly, this appears to be the same tricycle depicted being thrown off the school roof in Comic 4 of the Digital Comics series. I can't help but wonder what happened to the child from the story, though I don't imagine it's anything good. Inside the school, those same porcelain children from the comic are wreaking havoc. These little shitheads are the absolute worst. Clearly, most of the time, they have complete reign over the school, where they set booby traps for each other and destroy anything in their path, or just that they feel like destroying. In almost every room do these little fuckers terrorize you, tackling you, hitting you, and once even managing to separate you from Six, stealing her away and tying her up in a bathroom. In almost every room, but one. The next adult that we have to deal with is an entity known as the Teacher, and all things considered, she might be one of my favorite monsters from the series, for more reasons than just one. The first is that her design is just straight up horrifying. She's at least four times as tall as any of the children in her school, porcelain or otherwise. She's oddly one of the happiest looking creatures in the series, with her tight-lipped smile and huge, shining eyes, but like many of the adults in this series, her face and expression seem almost artificial. Like she was simply designed with a smile, and that the emotion she's actually feeling is anything but happy. And listen, I don't mean this as a criticism. I'm not saying it looks like the game designers did a bad job animating her face. I'm saying it looks like whatever creature in-universe put her together did a bad job of doing it. Speaking of in-universe design, you remember how one of those things you were supposed to be looking out for were instances of hidden identity? Well, if you played the series in order, you may have realized that while most of the monsters from the first game hid their identity a bit more noticeably, most of the monsters in this game, save for the hunter at the beginning, don't appear to be wearing a mask at all. One of the only consistent usages of masks in this game is actually from Mono, who was initially depicted wearing a bag on his head but later can pick up a number of other headpieces, all of which mostly hide his identity. That, mixed with the yellow raincoat that Six will find in just a second here, makes our protagonist some of the most shrouded characters that we'll encounter while playing. Of course, this mystery regarding their identities and features raises a significant, if potentially subconscious, question. Are they hiding something? It's a question that we'll have to wait to answer. Returning to this teacher character, the second thing that is so scary about her is the way that she behaves. Obviously, right? It's a horror game, and she's an enemy. She's obviously going to pursue you, but I don't just mean that. I mean the way she snaps her ruler against her desk, causing the students around her to jump. The way she leans over their shoulders, like real teachers do when they're trying to help you with their work. The way all the rowdy porcelain boys and girls suddenly go still and quiet when she's around. It's like the world is afraid of her, even the other scary parts of the world. Throughout the school, as you avoid the teacher both through stealth and by just booking it, you realize that there's more to how these children are treated than you once thought. Sure, they're little demons, and the reason they run the school is probably because no one wants to fucking deal with that, but in the context of the teacher's involvement with the school and discipline, suddenly the whole scene reeks of neglect, almost. There are children and dunce caps chained up as punishment. Are the violent tendencies of these children nature or nurture? Teachers play a pretty important role in the development of children, which can suck sometimes as it's a generally understaffed field, and that means that sometimes those positions can be filled by people who absolutely should not be teachers. I've encountered that in my own life a number of times. When you have a good teacher, that can make your life, honestly, but if you have a bad one, that can ruin it just as easily. The teacher in Little Nightmares seems to encapsulate every bad quality a person who works with children can have. A pension for cruelty and violence, an overwhelmingly controlling presence, a seeming delight for dealing discipline. These are qualities which seriously affect a child's trust in himself, other adults, education, and the world around him. Its depiction in Little Nightmares, while exaggerated, is all too accurate to what makes kids hate school and teachers. The Little Porcelain students are certainly emulatory of bullies, but who do you think taught them? You manage to escape the school by the skin of your teeth, or more accurately, the teachers. There are moments of downtime in between each of the levels of these games, moments where you can breathe and learn a bit about these characters and the city they're traversing through. During one of these moments of downtime, between this level and the next, while shivering through the pouring rain, Six finds a yellow raincoat washed out in the street, and there's a dramatic and significant moment, and she picks it up and dons it, revealing that she is, indeed, Six, shocking everyone except anyone who bought the game because Six was clearly depicted on the cover, which I'm not sure why they did that. Anyway, next up is the hospital. That place is spooky for sure.
The hospital section of Little Nightmares is effective primarily due to its focus on using darkness against you. When you enter the building, it almost seems abandoned, with only mannequins taking up the hallways, statuesque and yet still oddly resembling patients to some degree. Their placement and the way they stand or sit, it feels very much like a picture taken of an actual hospital environment. Chaotic and messy and a range of different maladies on display. This still scene is a snapshot of everything that makes hospitals overwhelming and intimidating, but that stillness pushes it further into a real surreal atmosphere. I'm sure those mannequins won't mean anything later. There are more than one horror to look out for while trying to escape this place. A big part of the reason you can't leave is because the elevator isn't powered, so that means that you and Six have to break into other rooms to find power sources, all while dealing with what might be waiting in those rooms. You find a flashlight in this level, a discovery that might make you immediately concerned for why you'd need it. You get your answer soon enough. As you may have expected, those mannequins from earlier aren't just mannequins. They're patients. Patients of who? Well, be patient, we'll get there in a second. That, I'm sorry, that wasn't even my script, that was fucking dumb. <laughs> when the lights go out in a room, something that you might expect to happen when, say, removing a power source from its socket, the patients begin to move in jerky, almost painful looking motions. They're coming for you, obviously, and what this means is that as you navigate these dark rooms and hallways, you have to be consistently swiveling, keeping your beam pointed on the most important threat. Sometimes there'll be several mannequins in a room, surrounding you on all sides, and you have to perfectly freeze and weave between them. It's very unsettling. These wordless, expressionless figures so seemingly desperate for... something. Just to kill? To be saved? To be seen? The question of what could have brought them here, what purpose they might serve, echoes through your mind just like the tap of your shoes on the linoleum floor as you navigate this horror show. This is clearly the place that girl was hidden, you know, the, the one from the third comic? Truthfully, it's one of the comics I have the hardest time parsing. Where did that spoon come from? Why was she trapped? It, is that what happens after a mannequin catches you? All of those questions pale, however, in the face of the most overwhelmingly crucial one. What was that thing that was following her at the end? Well, we find out now. The Doctor is a massive, whimpering figure that crawls on the ceiling in this hospital. The forces of gravity over the years have dragged his facial features down, so it always looks like he's sneering, and that his eyes are going to roll out of their sockets and down his wrinkled forehead. The Doctor is the one who's been responsible for making these mannequins. According to the Little Nightmares wiki, a wiki that should be taken with a grain of salt, as it's full of incomplete or incorrect information, the Doctor operates on patients who came to him out of boredom, replacing their fleshy parts with porcelain. Apparently, after he does this, the patients can no longer leave the hospital and are forced to remain here as animated puppets, the mannequins. The mention of porcelain in this description is interesting. Those school children from the last level were all made of porcelain. Is it possible that those school children were once regular children who underwent some kind of replacement? Maybe that's why the doctor was hunting the girl. The school was about to receive a new student. Regardless, getting around the doctor is an issue, as he has a very unique perspective on the world. And I don't mean he's a great philosopher. What I mean is, from his vantage point, he can see much more of the room, move around surprisingly quickly, and even lift hiding places out from on top of you, a trick that pretty much no other Little Nightmares enemy has ever been capable of. The doctor's office is a really scary place for kids, as is the hospital. Unless it's very specifically a children's hospital, the architecture and design of such places can feel cold and overwhelming, and even when it is, that unfamiliarity of the place, especially in the face of discomfort, sickness, or pain, is something that can really intimidate or even scare a child. Mix that with the loss of control that comes, the poking and prodding, and in reality, in intense and unfortunate cases, the cutting and inserting, it can all be very traumatizing. Doctors and nurses, if they're not careful, can take on an almost villainous appearance if their young patient doesn't understand what they're doing, or why, or that long term, these actions are in their best interest. I remember one of the first shots I had to get as a kid, how I shrieked and squirmed and had to be physically held down by a nurse to receive it. That kind of memory, my disdain for that nurse for taking away my ability to make my own choices, just for that brief instant, was infuriating and likely why I have such a problem with needles today. Was that nurse evil or even a bad person? Probably not. Certainly not because she was trying to vaccinate a child who couldn't understand why he needed it, but her intentions didn't make her actions any less scary. We don't really know the intentions of the doctor in Little Nightmares 2, but we can be pretty confident they're not as benevolent as regular health professionals. As we avoid the doctor, Six and Mono have to deal with a number more mannequins, as well as individual body parts that seem still conscious themselves. The implications of such consciousnesses are complicated. It's also here that we begin to see a fairly concerning shift in Six's behavior. 
After everything that she's dealt with, it's not surprising that Six has grown rather frustrated with her travels, but now we see a new cruelty coming out of her. In one scene, we lose track of her for a moment, only to discover her violently snapping backwards the fingers on a detached hand. This is not the first time we sense a deeper violence from Six, and it certainly won't be the last. There's not much more left for our protagonist to deal with in the city. The next level isn't really confined to one building so much as it is an exploration through many buildings. Rooms, rooftops, and alleyways that make up the Pale City proper, and during this exploration we finally meet the citizens of this surreal metropolis, and that note about boredom from the hospital level suddenly seems to make a bit more sense. The people here seem broken, mindless, maybe even hypnotized. Their faces are gone, which is ironic as the game refers to them as the Watchers. Not to be confused with The Watcher, a mysterious and potentially fabricated stalker who I talked about in a previous video, haha <laughs> shameless plug. The reason they're called The Watchers is because they're consistently watching TV. Like, all of them. You remember that fifth digital comic, the one about the ghost kid? Those two figures, the ones watching the TV, those are clearly Watchers. But what's interesting is that there's two of them. They're sitting together, watching in a home that they share. Don't they almost resemble a couple? Maybe even parents? The horror of the Watchers is that they're just normal enough. So much of their appearance is close to what we'd think of as a regular adult. The horror of these characters is that they almost seem to be tragic, like at some point maybe they were normal. That maybe this city used to be full of parents and children and work and play and school and healthcare and that all of it was corrupted by something. By what? What has been the universal, the constant source of fear and focus? Well, the TVs, the ones being manipulated by the signal tower, the ones that were there from the very beginning of the game, the ones Mono keeps being sucked into. But why? Why do they matter so much? What's in them? The signal tower clearly controls everything, but we still don't know why. When their TVs are turned off, the watchers get aggressive, angry, and will do anything in their power to access another TV. Making your way through the city, Mono has to use this fact to get around the horrible figures. The TVs are his tool. That is, until the last time he enters a television. Every time Mono has entered this scene, he's managed to get closer and closer to the door, but every time before he can reach it, he's pulled out. That doesn't happen this time. This time, he makes it to the door, jumps up to the handle, opens it, and reveals the final enemy of the game. A man sitting on a chair, wearing a hat. Except. This man is capable of more than any enemy we've ever seen. Throughout our playthrough, we've encountered these little black echoes all over the place, ghostly figures that seem to resemble children, but that disappear when Mono draws close to them. Now we know what those figures are. They're the echoes of the children that this figure, known as the Thin Man, took. We find this out as the Thin Man manages to exit the TV with Mono, teleports after the fleeing duo, and manages to catch Six, leaving only a shade of her behind. And with that, Mono reaches the end of his journey. Though he's been dragging Six through the streets and buildings with a focus and determination that we could not understand, it now seems that all of the hard work, all of the fear and effort have led to this. Mono runs from the man for as long as he can before finally being cornered by him in an alley. With nothing left to do, Mono puts up his hand as a defense against this terrible figure and realizes he can manipulate the man in quite the same way he'd been manipulating the TVs. This signal, the one being sent out by the tower in the distance, the one that seems so tightly tied to this Thin Man character, is one that Mono seems also tied to. He manages to defeat the Thin Man and is able to manipulate the Pale City to such a degree that suddenly, the tower is just in front of him. This is the final goal, the place we've known all of this was leading to. The inside of the tower is probably not what you were expecting. Inside the building, pink light streams from doorways as ethereal singing echoes from places we are simply not certain. This place is more like a dream or potentially nightmare than any level we've encountered before. With all our enemies defeated, that we know of at least, all that's left to do is find Six. She has to be here, it wouldn't make sense for her to be anywhere else. In fact, the song coming from each of the doorways is the very same song Six had been listening to when Mono found her in the woods all those hours ago, I guess? It's wild, it feels like you've been through so much together, you and Six, but in reality, you barely know each other and have only been in close proximity for a short time. But surely that's enough to trust Six, isn't it? Enough to make it an imperative that you find her, rescuing her again. 
Eventually, you do find her. You follow that music to a room with a music box and a monstrous, mutated version of Six. Dear God, what did this place do to her? Her existence seems terrifying, even to herself, and much like from the beginning of the story, only the quiet, gentle, and almost haunting tones of her music box seem to bring her peace. You smash the music box. Screw her peace, you have to get out of here. It takes a couple hits to fully destroy the music box, and during this process, the mutated version of Six is getting incredibly mad. She's screaming, trying to attack you and guarding the music box with her long, spindly hands. It takes abusing the nonsensical dream logic of this place to trick her into leaving her box unattended for just a few moments at a time, and each time you hit it, the world seems to echo, and you get a peek at this dark, strange place behind the curtain of reality. On the last hit of the box, though, you see the truth. A massive, carrion wall of watching eyes and bubbling flesh makes up the true essence of the signal tower. There's no answer here, no sudden realization about the true nature of all of this world, only another detail to add to the confusion. But there's no time to think about that. With the last smash of the music box, Six is freed, returning to her regular form, but that wall of flesh, like some monster out of Terraria, begins expanding and chasing after Six and Mono, absolutely wrecking the tower and causing the terrain to splinter and crumble under your feet. Six has a head start on you for some reason, and as you flee the incoming wall of gore, you remain at her heels, the ground giving way closer and closer to your feet until you're right by the exit on a thin platform that gives way well before you reach the end. Six is at the other end, and for a moment while you're running, the game dramatically putting this desperate scene in slow motion, you might remember that very first moment of teamwork at the bridge, Six standing in a very similar place to where she is now, you flying through the air, your faith fully placed in this little girl who never speaks, and you think to yourself, She'll catch me, right? She'll catch me, just like the last time, and every time before, right? She wouldn't just let me fall. And you're right, she wouldn't. Six catches your hand, and for a moment, you dangle there, looking up into the shrouded face of the girl you've dragged through hell. The one who was strung up by porcelain bullies, the one who was attacked by disembodied hands and groaning monsters, the one who followed you despite you only bringing her into more and more dangerous situations. And though the two of you have never really spoken to each other, and though you cannot even fully see the girl's expression, as you hang there in her grasp, a puzzle piece clicks into place a moment too late. Six wasn't your friend. She was just someone who happened to be in the same place you were. She was never kind, she was just doing what she had to do to survive. She was never altruistic, she just knew she'd have an easier time navigating this fucked up world if she could count on another person. These are the realizations that come as the puzzle pieces complete the picture in your head, the one built from minor scenes of violence or cruelty or willingness to hurt people to reach her goals, and even just because. That puzzle piece allows you to finally spell out the message that has been being built in your head over the course of your entire playthrough. You shouldn't have trusted Six. She lets you go. Betrayal, remember? One of those crucial elements to watch out for. If only Mono had known. Six drops you. Why, we cannot be fully sure. She's an enigma even under the best of circumstances. But truthfully, it's a moment we should have seen coming, especially if we played the games in order. Six is so much more than just a little kid. But we can't focus on Six now. She's gone, leaving through the doorway to some unknown place as we, Mono, fall into the gurgling flesh and are consumed. And finally, the real end of Little Nightmares 2 arrives. We find ourselves in a pit, surrounded on all sides by emotionless but ever-watching eyes. Sat there in this hellscape of ceaseless watching, we're almost consumed by the mass but are able to avoid it, utilizing that strange power we have access to once again, forcing the mass away and changing the setting so it resembles a more regular room. It's almost like you're hiding the truth from yourself, dreadfully aware that the eyes are still there but unwilling to subject yourself to their constant gaze. There's no way out of this place, not that you can see. In fact, all that seems to be around you is a chair. You take a seat and wait. You wait for years. You grow up in that chair. First, an older child. Then a teen.
than a young adult, then... A man, the whole time growing and growing, growing taller than a regular adult would be, thinner than you might normally be. As your age, your style changes, becoming more formal, a suit, and then additionally, a hat. It's over the course of your entire life, sat in that room, waiting, that you realize who you really are. Why you could control the TVs, and by extension, the signal. Why that thin man kept following you, why you kept having that dream. The man was you. Maybe blinded and warped by the years, or maybe just trying to break the cycle, to stop himself from being betrayed by that little girl in the raincoat, to escape the room that he had spent his entire childhood running towards. It's a doomed narrative, a cycle. The game ends the way it begins. A long, twisting hallway with a door at the end. Except this time, we know what's behind the door. We know what happens next, and again, and again, and again. What we don't know is what happened to Six. And unfortunately, we'll have to wait to find out. This video has already turned out much longer than I thought it would be, and we haven't even gotten to the first game or the podcast. Six as a character requires so much analysis and theorizing to be understood, enough that I think it would be better to let that analysis be a full video in itself. So, in the next video, which should hopefully be out pretty soon after this video's release, we'll talk about the very first entry into the series, as well as the most recent, and what both of these entries mean for the larger world as a whole, and Six herself as a character. Thank you again to Aura for sponsoring this video. They are a great company, and I really appreciate their support. If you're excited to see part two of this video, consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you don't miss it, or even becoming a member, a decision that helps me keep making the content you enjoy seeing. The art in this video was made by eArts04 on Instagram, and you can help support myself and him by buying some merch, which he had a great hand in designing. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much. I really love this series, and it's been a treat to get so deep into the universe. I hope you enjoyed the video and are looking forward to part two. Have a great night, boneheads.